for us outside of the of the inner scientific community, it has the impression because of broader media coverage that the positions that you have and um, and, and and the way you go is a sort of a, is sort of a minority position is a, is an anti mainstream position. Is that the case? I don't think that this is the case. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, very precarious to try to uh, mold positions into minority and majority because science is nuanced. It's not like black and white. Uh, it's not that I have one position. I have probably a hundred positions or a thousand positions and some of them may be wrong, some of them may be correct. I hope all of them can be improved. And I think that this uh, is uh, true also for other scientists. Uh, you have seen lots of efforts to polarize science during the pandemic. Uh, there have been lots of open letters. There's been a lot of uh, memoranda. There have been declarations, uh, uh, some of them fiercely opposing each other. For example, there has been the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, mostly against lockdown. And there has been the Jon Snow Memorandum, mostly in favor of lockdown. Uh, probably, if you look very closely, you will realize that they agree in most points, but there are points of disagreement. Personally, I didn't sign any memorandum, any declaration, any open letter, because I don't believe that this is how science should operate. I believe that science has continuity, it has nuance, it has evolution in our thinking, in our data, in our evidence, in, in our conclusions unavoidably. And therefore, I believe that it's not an issue of vote counting. It, it is... Uh, an integration of multiple pieces of evidence and multiple perspectives. And I think that sometimes we missed some of that holistic approach because some of the people who did sign letters or declarations or memoranda, they took a very fierce stance that they know all the truth. And not only that, but their opponents know nothing. And I think that this is a very simplistic uh, kind of mistreatment of, of the scientific enterprise. Would you say that this was a step towards activism that many of your colleagues undertook? I believe that activism really suppressed science during the pandemic. And activism, I have nothing against activism because it can fight for worthy purposes. Uh, there's so many things that are wrong in our world. We have climate change, uh, we have the tobacco industry really making billions and trillions and one billion deaths to happen in the next century. And they're even growing stronger during the pandemic with more people smoking. So we you, have so many worthy causes to yeah. fight for. And of course, the pandemic is a worthy cause to fight for, to decrease the impact of the virus and to decrease the impact also of the measures that uh, may have collateral damages. But we have to be careful when activism moves from a subject matter where we know a lot, like tobacco is killing or is going to kill one billion people. There's very little doubt about this unless we do something. We know about the risks with high accuracy, with very little or no uncertainty, versus a new pandemic, a new virus, a pandemic wave that evolves over time that we have very little predictive ability. Even the best teams in the world have failed again and again to predict what will happen like next week. <laughs> that is interesting because you say that activism or, or the need or, or it, of activism is a question of how, how much do we know, are we certain about something. When I, would, I would rather say uh, activism should be never an option for scientists because the scientist, for, 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 for AOIPSO, I, I would say a scientist doesn't take sides in any case, even if it's, if it's a good side. Some people said the same about journalism. There was a famous journalist, public um, uh, broadcasting man in Germany, who said a journalist never should take sides even if it's the good side. Wouldn't be that true also for science? I, I, I think we have to be very careful to say that this is activism and this is science. And when it is a science is being involved, there's a high risk that this will be completely confounded if a scientist becomes an activist. I, I don't want to limit our colleagues from becoming activism, mm. be activists because, as, as I said, there's so many worthy causes to fight for as activists. But when they do that, I think that they need to say, I'm doing this as an activist, not as a scientist right now. Uh, don't read what I say mm. as something that is written by a scientist. Many scientists are very active, for example, in social media. Personally, I don't have personal social media, either Facebook or Twitter. As I have uh, written in my uh, webpage at Stanford, I admire those who can 
pour their wisdom in social media and they're error free. Personally, I feel that I make a lot of mistakes. I need to revisit what I write and what I want to publish multiple times before I publish it, so as to minimize mistakes. And I, I don't want to make a fool of myself more frequently than it is absolutely necessary. But I, I see that many scientists really cross that boundary into activism very easily. And I, I wish that they do good. I, I hope that they could do good. But sometimes they reach probably levels of certainty and aggressiveness and oppressiveness that, to my opinion, <laughs> I think they're damaging science. I, I think they're heavily damaging science. That's not, on, that's not only an abstract question, because I mean, you, you know personally what that can mean, because in a way, and for some time, that aggression that was produced in activistic, I would say, science um, yeah, ideas hurt you personally, no? Uh, indeed, uh, getting uh, death threats and hate mail and having social media hoaxes that uh, uh, cause your your family to be in danger for their lives. You know, my, my mother uh, had a hypertensive crisis when there was a social media hoax that she had died of coronavirus. And then all her friends were calling at her home uh, saying, when is the funeral? And uh, when did she die? And she went into a hypertensive crisis before because of this. Uh, getting hate mail is a chilling experience. And I, I know of many scientists who had the same experience of of this stream of hate, why? Just because they were trying to do science. I'm, I'm not going to say whether they were right or wrong in what mm. they concluded and whether their calculations were 100% correct or 80% or 10% correct, but this type of, of treatment of people who do not agree with one stance, regardless of whether they are the minority or the majority, doesn't doesn't really fit to science. It doesn't really fit to a society that really wants to help itself eventually. I, I don't really care what is the minority and the, the majority in science. In, in fact, in many issues where people have said, you know, for lockdowns, for example, that those who are against draconian lockdowns are the minority, this is not really true. If, if you look at the uh, prestige and impact and number of scientists who signed the Great Barrington Declaration, they far outnumber those who signed the John Snow Memorandum. I, I signed neither. Uh, <laughs> but, you but, wouldn't call, but you wouldn't count votes, of course. But, but I would I not, mean, of said, course. Of course, sometimes it's not too easy to draw a line between, um, between activism and, 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 and science, because of course, if you are convinced that the results that you got from your unbiased research are right, then there is, it, is, it is quite understandable that you would draw consequences for societal or political reactions on what is here. So, I mean, you personally, you said your, your consequences or your conclusions nevertheless are clear. You are not an activist, but it's clear that you are very skeptical about draconian lockdowns. It's clear that you find that the danger of this virus is overestimated hugely worldwide. And, and, and the third is that your conclusion is that it would have been better to protect risk groups in the population rather than sort of um, roll out measures for everybody in society. So there are clear conclusions, of course, that you draw. And I think that you also state is not necessarily activism already, no? Drawing conclusions is not activism. Uh, one has to be very careful to attach the right level of uncertainty. So talking about lockdowns uh, as a key example, uh, I will never argue that my models are the truth and that Imperial College models are, are wrong. Uh, I think that there is merit to look at both, to compare notes, to see what they say. but. It's not just about models. It's not about case counts. It's not just about COVID-19 per se. We have to take a holistic view at all the other impacts on health, on mental health, on education, on our society, on all the other diseases that are neglected, on care that is disrupted, on prospects for global starvation, for poverty, for unemployment, for, for people just losing their minds if we continue that for much, much longer. And, this is where I take a pretty firm stance that if you look at the holistic picture, not just the academic debate that I may have against colleagues who use different models with somehow different conclusions. If you look at the holistic picture, then we have to be very careful 
we need to look at all the dimensions mm -hmm. of our health, of what it means to be human, what it means to have a society, what it means to have a world that is not really being dismantled. I mean, what you said is that um, if you look at the holistic picture, we cannot go on longer with this. I mean, it has gone for 18 months now in, in, in more or less intensity. Um, so it's always easy to say we shouldn't do that longer. It's, it's, it's a little bit bigger problem to say we shouldn't have done this for such a long time. I, I would not go back. Whatever was done, was done. I think we have to be very careful to avoid blaming people. Uh, it would assume that uh, we should have known everything from the beginning, and this is not true. It's impossible to do that. I would argue that uh, we need to avoid tension within society, trying to pointing fingers and trying to create artificial rifts. The worst thing that can happen is to create a, a rift between uh, belongers into one camp and belongers to the other mm. camp uh, and going into civil war or war or strife or revolutions or, or people just being upset at their neighbor. We have gone through a year and a half of a very horrible time. Uh, many people are shell-shocked. They're very modestly trying to exit from their apartments. Uh, some of them, I met some of my colleagues and they told me, you are the first person I, I meet after 15 months. Uh, and we need to avoid putting extra stress in that overstress situation. So I'm very much against people raising their voice to blame or to uh, dissect uh, who is really to blame the most. Okay. But <laughs> you, you say we shouldn't and we cannot go back in time. As a matter of fact, you were one of the really early ones who warned and said, well, if we do those restrictive measures, draconian lockdowns, there will be casualties um, and we should look on that side. We should also collect data for, for that consequences and you were not heard. That's, I think uh, that that's, this is that's sad. fact. And it's sad. And, and maybe and, and if we think about the reasons, why wouldn't you have been heard, although you had data with you for your position, can it be that that was the, the power of pictures, let's say? Because there was, there, was, there was really a huge amount of data around very early, especially March, April, you had the data. But there were pictures. Is, is that the problem? We had the pictures of Bergamo, of a, Wuhan, a, an of New York. An image is a thousand words, clearly. And uh, an, an image is, is worth uh, a thousand scientists. <laughs> and it's very difficult to counter these images. Uh, I think it's wrong to say that uh, either myself or others were belittling the consequences of the pandemic. Uh, from the very beginning, I said that this is a major crisis and, and this is why both myself and so many other scientists thought that we should really jump into the fray and try to, to do whatever we could best in trying to generate reliable evidence and finding the best solutions. It is a devastating virus. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, this is not as serious as it is. I would disagree with this. It can be devastating to some people. It is a minority of the population, but elderly people and people who are in nursing homes and very vulnerable individuals, it can be devastating. Mm. The vast majority of the population, though, it is not. So we should factor that That in should our have response. consequences, shouldn't it? It has consequences for everyone. It's not just for the vulnerable. So, for example, when we shut down our schools for so long, that was really a major blunder, in my opinion, because we left so many students. 90% of students around the world had disruption of their education. Those who were wealthy, they had better opportunities to still get some education compared to those who were not, to those who were disadvantaged. Lots of students will never return back to their studies. We have good studies from the Netherlands that had probably one of the best opportunities to do teleeducation, and they had infrastructure to educate children from a distance. Even in Netherlands, what we know now is that during that time that schools were shut down, children learned very little, next to nothing. And those who were not wealthy, the non-wealthy children, they regressed 60% more compared to the children who were wealthy. In my country, in the US, we have lots of children who depend for their life to get food. Mm. They have to go to school to get food to eat. So. Even more I, so like in African countries. Uh, it's, yeah. it's unfortunate that the US is a very wealthy country. At the same time, we have several parts of the populations who are so neglected and so disadvantaged that it is a little bit like being 
in a sub-Saharan African country. And not only we, we allow that inequality, we allow that disadvantage, we allow racism, we allow poverty in the midst of our society, we put those lockdowns that are really making life much more difficult for them. It's making life difficult for those who are the have-nots. It's making life easier for me, who I have a nice home and I can give lectures by Zoom and I can teach and I can do everything that I want. But for those who are disadvantaged, for those who are essential workers, they are out there, they get infected. Many of them are far more vulnerable than I am. If they are infected, they will get to the hospital. Some of them will die. We, we saw this huge inequality that is shattering our society becoming worse because of the measures that we are taking. So what you say, and if I would try to sum it up, is that you think that the draconian measures, the lockdowns, they sort of um, hit the wrong people, the ones that were already weak, and that they were overall, you would say, this sort of amount of measures during a such long period of time was not appropriate to the threat that the virus was for society. I, I, I think so? that the response was uh, not uh, appropriated uh, properly. Uh, and it was not aiming to really help those who needed to be helped. It helped people like me who really didn't need that much help. I could protect myself. And it led lots of vulnerable pe people out there in the community being infected, being slaughtered. Uh, in many other countries that even had weaker health systems, it was even worse. The U.S. is one country that, you know, even though we have excellent medicine in terms of medical science, we have a very large segment of our population being uninsured. Uh, in many other locations, even with developed health systems, the interventions of draconian lockdown created an imbalance in health care. It led people with common diseases that could be treated very well, like heart attacks. They wouldn't get treatment. Un untreated. I mean, there might be, but one might complain about the fact that pictures are stronger than data and scientific data, but there might be one truth in those pictures that we saw Bergamo, New York, other places, that the danger of that virus and its potential to devastate people and regions is very specific. It's, it has always been hotspot. It was not one country or the other country. It was not two big regions that were affected. It was, in fact, hotspots, so the, the conditions of maybe even climate, health system, social, social system had a huge influence and age, of course. It, the, the risk stratification was quite clear and that, that meant that it was always quite condensed regions and situations that the virus was really dangerous in. It is a virus of inequality. So when it strikes, it's, it strikes in a very unequal way. And it, it is true that we had hot spots and this doesn't mean that you cannot get a hot spot from a location that has been spared in the past. But if we learn from our mistakes, both from our successes and our failures, I think we can avoid creating these hot spots because we, we have very clear sense about the risk stratification of this infection. We know who are the people who are the most vulnerable. We know that there are some places like nursing homes that accounted for 30 to 80 percent of deaths in the first wave. We did a little better afterwards because we did learn, hopefully, and we, we have to protect them very carefully rather than do the opposite, rather than send people who are infected with COVID-19 to nursing homes, we, where eventually we got a higher proportion of nursing home residents being infected compared to the general population. Instead of protecting them, we did exactly the opposite. So some of these hotspots, to a large extent, are created by our own mistakes, our own inability to learn on how this virus operates, what it does, to whom, and how we can avoid these massacres in, in the future. Now that we even have vaccines, we should be in a much better position to avoid these massacres. So I mean, one of the consequences and one of the things that we really know is that there were many casualties in nursing homes. And the other thing is that um, no matter how strongly or how strictly you react, that has consequences. And, and um, I think it's, in the meantime, it's consensus for science and politics that uh, lockdowns and restrictive measures have consequences and do collateral harms um, for economy, for, for, for health. Um, it's, it's, it's coming clear more and more. Maybe we have a short overview over collateral damages. 
Corona hält seit eineinhalb Jahren die Welt in Atem. In vielen Regionen steht das Leben aufgrund harter Maßnahmen nahezu still. Die Kollateralschäden dieser Politik werden nun immer offensichtlicher. Ängste und Depressionen haben extrem zugenommen, von Deutschland bis Korea. Zahlen belegen jetzt, dass in Österreich etwa jeder fünfte Jugendliche unter Angstsymptomen leidet. Selbst Kinder äußern so häufig Suizidgedanken wie noch nie. Zugenommen hat auch die Fettleibigkeit in der Gesamtbevölkerung. Ärzte befürchten Langzeitfolgen wie eine starke Zunahme an Herz-Kreislauf-Leiden bis hin zu Krebs. Während die Vermögenden in der Krise noch reicher wurden, hat die gedrosselte Weltwirtschaft vor allem in Schwellenländern für eine zunehmende Massenarbeitslosigkeit und Verelendung gesorgt. Professor Yanis, can one say or would you say that the measures against the coronavirus um, will lead to the fact that we really experience overwhelming health problems for many people who were not affected by the virus? Or would you even say that the consequences or the collateral damages are even um, as big or even bigger as, as, as the harm that the virus has done? Obviously, we need to measure these collateral damages very, very carefully. But I think that what we have seen so far suggests that collateral damages affect almost everyone, different people to a different extent. And unfortunately, the disadvantaged people are affected even more. To my experience and my calculations and what I have seen in the literature, I think that these collateral damages far outnumber and outweigh the impact of the pandemic itself, of the virus itself, which is grave. I don't want to diminish this. I don't want to, to underestimate it. But when you hear about uh, hundreds of people around the world, hundreds of millions of people around the world really moving into or below poverty, um, huge numbers becoming unemployed, huge numbers added to, to those who are starving. Uh, and you know that every year there's 9 million people dying because of starvation. You know that 5 million people every year or, or more are dying because of dysfunctional health system that become even more dysfunctional as we completely distort our, our efforts to take care of, of populations. When you know that um, we have so many other problems like mental health, where we have rates of 50, 60, 70 percent of the population sometimes facing mental health problems like anxiety, depression, huge stress. How can you compare that to 0.05 percent of the population being the overall fatality rate for uh, COVID-19 until now? Maybe there's some undercounting, but you can increase that by a little bit. How do you compare 0.05 percent versus rates of 50 percent? or very high rates of, uh, of huge impact in, in the whole world. 